So welcome once again. Tonight's topic is telescope mount electronics. I was uh, doing some repair action on a couple of my mounts to get them ready uh, for public outreach once again and uh, said, I better document this stuff. So I said, well, what if I document what I learn in a presentation and then put it up on our YouTube site so that more people can learn about stuff. So that's that's where this came from. But as usual, first we'll do the news. So I keep following what the uh, JWST, the Webb Space Telescope is doing and it's still cooling down. They need to get to seven Kelvin. I thought it was kind of interesting that NASA was actually describing it as Kelvins as opposed to Kelvin. Uh. There is a distinction that whenever you're talking in Kelvin, you should not say degrees Kelvin because that's two different types of units. Mm. So they should be talking about less than seven Kelvin as opposed to the, the aliens on Star Trek, which are Kelvins. So anyway, they're still cooling down the mid-infrared instrument, Miri. Uh, they did some housekeeping this week. They fired the thruster to uh, adjust its uh, L2 orbit point. Um, if you remember from our presentation, the uh, orbit about L2 is an ellipse that was squished in the middle and then tilted. So they're constantly fighting with gravity one way or gravity the other way using thrusters and uh, solar radiation reflection pressure on a giant aluminum panel and uh, on the uh, solar film on the bottom of the, of the spacecraft. So yeah, every so often they have to give it a little thrust to get it back in the right direction. So if you ever need to uh, find out what's going on with the web, uh, an email I sent you the web blog. Um, and NASA seems to be having more of these as where to easily find out the latest information about any of their programs. So if you just go to blogs.nasa.gov slash and then the name of the program like web. And this week we had the launch of the first private commercial mission to the space station. Now, SpaceX may have been the launch vehicle and the capsule provider, but the astronauts are actually from a separate private corporation called Axion. And the mission is AX-1. Three of the astronauts paid 50 some odd million dollars a head to be on board the, uh, the spacecraft. And the fourth one, uh, fourth astronaut is actually the mission commander provided by Axiom Space. Their idea is to um, create a space station called uh, um, Hub One that will eventually be a private space station where they will conduct industrial processes and industrial experimentation where you can do things in space in near zero gravity uh, that you cannot do on the surface of the earth. Um, pharmacological stuff, metallurgy stuff, uh, and there's a number of manufacturing operations that do quite a bit better when there's no gravity pulling them down. So this is the example of the first uh, commercial operations in space. And it's getting crowded out there. Look at them all. And the other detail is that he, I, his idea is that to use uh, the structure of the space station now to start his space station. He's not going to start from zero. He can already have a base before the yep. space station is sent to uh, burn down. Yep, they'll, they'll have a component of what will be their hub one. And then when the space station is no more, they're looking to take that piece and move it over and start their own space station called hub one. The, um, the as I was talking about NASA blogs, there's one for Artemis, the uh, back to the moon program, which is kind of strange because the Artemis astronauts are actually not going to land on the moon. They're going to go around the moon and then SpaceX is going to provide their rocket as the means to actually land on the moon. So it's, it's funny that we're still spending considerable money on SLS and Artemis when eventually it's going to flip over to become a uh, 
SpaceX program anyway. It's just NASA will be paying SpaceX to ride. Yeah, so um, they tried a couple of times this week to complete their wet dress rehearsal. Now, a wet dress rehearsal is when they roll the rocket over to the launch platform. They fill it up with its cryogenic liquids, um, hydrogen and oxygen, and then they take it down to within about 10 seconds prior to launch, and then they stop it. They drain everything out of it back into the tanks on the ground, and then they roll it back into the shed and see if anything needs to be replaced or repaired. So that's, you know, they've tried that a couple of times. Most of the problems that they've had relate to either weather or to um, issues with the actual launch complex, the, the ground platform itself, not with the rocket. Um, but they'll try again Tuesday and Thursday uh, of this coming week to see if uh, they can finally complete their wet dress rehearsal. So not to be outdone, everybody's looking for the oldest, farthest things, be it stars or galaxies or quasars, which are galaxies. Um, and uh, they've claimed that they've now found something that's ah, 13 billion-ish years out in space, uh, light years. And... Uh, you know, they've got competing programs. There are two uh, reports in uh, Cornell University's online site, the uh, ARXID, um, on finding very, very distant things that they believe are galaxies. Um, they're very proud to announce that, yes, we realize that these things might have originally been UV, but now they're infrared because expansion of the universe and everything and my thought was well if that's really the case why are you looking in infrared with small instruments when you've got giant radio telescope arrays the very large array uh, or the earth size baseline interferometry array you could look in that and find even older things even farther back in time maybe another one or two billion years so, you know, just when you think you you found something old, people like me go, well, it might have been UV at one time, but now it's infrared. But why aren't you looking in radio if you really want to find the old stuff? And speaking of not to be outdone, uh, outdone um, in light of all the stuff that's going on with the um, European Union's scientific and physics research labs, um, the U.S.'s Fermi lab has once again said, <laughs> look, look what we did. Um, they've been for the last 10 years trying to come up with an accurate measurement of the W boson, which is a subatomic particle. They want to measure the mass, but you're not really measuring it as mass, like a weight scale. You're measuring it as electromotive force in electron volts or um, you know, how, ma how many electron volts. And um, they claim they now have uh, a measurement of the mass by way of electron volts of the W boson to within 0 0.01% uh, um, something of accurate. You know, how do you, how do you know how far away you are from the real number if you don't know what the real number is and you're measuring it? Uh, but now it's up to other groups beyond Fermi Lab to repeat the same experiment and come away with a similar mass number very close to what Fermilab has done because everyone else's measurement is different than what Fermilab did by more than two digits at the end of a very small fractional number. The crux of this is if what Fermilab is stating is accurate and needs to be confirmed by other labs, but if it is accurate, it means we have to go back to the standard model and reevaluate anything based upon the W boson's mass to see if the model might need a little tweaking. So that, that's why it's important to get this stuff right and have a consensus of accuracy across all the different labs around the planet. And um, Fermi Lab has been the outlier. 
if, if you remember when they first started this controversy over the W boson mass, um, they actually had a magnet that was uh, at the Brookhaven lab on Long Island, which didn't have the funding to continue the 10 year long work. And so they shipped the magnet to Fermilab, who then put it in their accelerator to make the measurements because they had the funding. So. Yes, just to clarify the uh, in the standard model, the W boson is the carrier for radioactivity. So yeah. uh, it causes radioactivity, the changes in W boson. Yep. They just here indirectly referred to it as um, the subatomic particle that conveys energy. Energy is a very wide definition. But they're measuring it as uh, electron volts. So as the saying goes, watch this space. And next up is, I was watching the rodeo this week from uh, Austin, Texas. And uh, Elon said, look for us to put into production on a limited basis, the Tesla bot by early next year. So, but what, what it will be capable of doing is it a buy or lease model? How much is it going to cost? Uh, all to be defined. So, but it's not going to be called Adam. It's going to be called Optimus Subprime, like subprime mortgages. The um, the cartoon character is uh, in the Autobots is called Optimus Prime because he's one of the prime uh, androids and. Uh, since the Tesla bot, when it is first released, will not be capable of doing anything and everything a human does, it'll have limited capabilities. He jokingly referred to it as Optimus Subprime. <laughs> so that's robotic humor. Okay, did I miss any news stories? Yes, there was a story about uh, Sophia studying the magnetic field of the galaxy's bones. I had not heard the term bones used for the galaxy before. Sophia, as in the 747? Yeah, I believe I so. I missed that one, and I'm let, supposed let, to know. Let me give you the link. Okay, give me, give me the link, because Sophia is an infrared imaging system, magnetic they have, fields. Uh, they they measure magnetic fields. They they can see the lines of the magnetic fields with a, um, a magnetometer. But it, it, they measure the polarization of the particles in the galaxy. I think I saw that uh, a while ago. I just put it in the chat. Okay, I just clicked on it. Let's see what happens. Okay, it shows magnetic fields in the G forty seven bone overlaying atop an image. Okay, Sophia took the image in infrared and it looks like they got the magnetic data from Herschel as seen by the Herschel Space Observatory. So I think that uh, Sophia contributed the infrared background image and Herschel con uh, contributed the actual uh, magnetic field distortion sitting on top of it. No, it's the opposite. This is the infrared from Herschel, and the squiggly lines that you see are the polarization of the particles seen by Sophia. How does an infrared telescope see magnet lines of magnetic? You see in the bottom, polarization map, 2021. Yeah, that's, um, I'm trying to find out how so it the, the squiggly lines that you see on the top of the picture, that's the data from Sophia. I yeah, thought I saw it. It's something about using dust to infer the magnetic field. I'm not sure. Yes, uh, it's the polarization because the particles have charge, but depending which charge, because the, the electrons have two uh, orientations or some of the particles have different orientations, so they have different polarization. And then you can see the lines and the direction of the dust by observing the polarization because they follow the magnetic fields just like aurora. Okay, so they didn't directly measure the magnetic fields. What they're doing is they're measuring the phase difference in the infrared light and from that 
creating they a map of the magnetic field. A map of the magnetic field. Yeah. Okay. And then it said something about the magnetic field preventing the formation of stars in certain yes. areas or yeah. corralling yeah. the formation yes. of stars. That's why uh, normally for you to have a star burst, you need larger stars. There have solar wind to complex to, to compress the cloud to cause the, the stellar formation or the explosion of the star to to actually compress you know the shock wave compressing the clouds because if you see those inter interstellar clouds they are in equilibrium so if you have one particles that's charged like this the next particle that is side by side is going to flip to be the other side so the whole cloud is in equilibrium and when a cloud is in equilibrium that's very difficult to cause cloud collapse so the only way is for you to have changes in magnetic fields caused by other objects. Yeah, uh, aboard Sophia, they use the Hawk Plus polarimeter, which measures the phase differential of the infrared light in entering the image and instrument. If you go back to the picture, you actually can see the Herschel data is the infrared, yes. and then Sophia add the signal with the squeak. Yeah, but that's not a direct image of the magnetic fields. That's a prediction of the magnetic fields based upon phase changes in the infrared light. The dust. It's not, yeah. not the, the, the dust in infrared, so they use the polarimeter. Right, but if the dust is not irradiating something, there's nothing for an infrared polarimeter to measure. So they're measuring the polarity, the phase differences in the infrared light samples through this region. And then they're drawing dark lines where the phases are different from the lighter lines where the phases are opposite to that. So you can sort of indirectly predict where the magnetic field lines will be of one polarity versus another. Still, it's always interesting to see that we can gather new data from the tools we already have and the images we might already have. You know, like taking a look at it anew. Cool. The other thing that's not quite news is I was looking at my Facebook page. I put on my Facebook page a, a picture of a moon and the Milky Way that is 3D and is super awesome for you to observe. So if you go there, you can actually map around and see uh, the moon and, and you can see the Milky Way. You can look up and down, especially if you have your phone, you can move the phone, but you can uh, use the mouse too to do that also. Yes, that's the one. Very beautiful. My question was, how is it that they get the spacecraft, this, this is the uh, spacecraft that's on the uh, far side of the moon. How is it that they get spacecraft in such sharp focus and at the same time, check that out. Oh, stop. No, no. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, I, I think what they did was they superimposed an image of the plane of the galaxy behind the uh, lunar image. I there don't know is. how they did that, but you could do Imagine that the, the best sky you can have, it's on the moon. Yeah, but, but this can't work. This, this is a collage. This is not a real yes. photographic image with the lander the moon surface and the deep sky in the background that's an impossible picture the contrast ratio is just way too wide yeah yeah it, it is a collage but they yes. you know they put the components with the the camera so it it's it's not that they superimpose all the pictures the pro the lander did all the pictures and they put the collage together that's these two how pictures they were large. these two pictures were not taken by this spacecraft the one in the background is a completely different image okay. taken by something else. Uh, the other thing that I want to mention is that it's really cool because it uh, puts together two things that I really like. It's on my Facebook page too, is the, they found, uh, they most likely found the, uh, the dinosaurs, oh, the, the, the asteroid, particles of the, the asteroid that they killed the dinosaur. That's the hypothesis. It's still peer review still, 
So it's a BBC News. Even and this below. guy, is, uh, he's from Florida or lived in Florida because one of our uh, friends, Facebook friends, she, she mentioned that she, he was in his backyard, like he was neighbor. So dinosaurs fossil from asteroid strike that caused the extinction found by scientists, scientists claim. So this is still to be peer reviewed, but they found in the same layer. And then on the droplets from the, the ejecta, the, they think they found the piece of the, of the asteroid. And the dinosaur fossil that also, uh, that died in that time. Because when you go to museums and you observe the, the asteroids, you, you can have like samples of dinosaurs that died before and dinosaurs that you know were uh die after but or like not exactly in the date but they found that one to be like the closest one you can get yeah so they found a dinosaur fossil how would you analyze it to come to the conclusion that part of that fossil contains debris from the asteroid impact no, I think I read somewhere else. The same area they found ejecta. Uh -huh. that, I don't know if it was this same article or maybe some other article, but I found in the same area the dinosaurs that happened in that time and also the ejecta. The, 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 when you find during impact, you, you can find that the silica, it's kind of, uh, you know, shattered, you know, like yeah. broken apart. So, and then you can recognize and date that particle and, and kind of date the same thing. And they might right. have found also. But I don't know if this, this same article or something else that I read. But I found it interesting that they found the dinosaurs from the exactly time of the extinction. You know, we need to someday realize that if we spent all the money that we're spending to find out what happened in the past by just creating the ability to do remote time viewing <laughs> you don't have to go there maybe you just need to look there so th this one this di this specific dinosaur it died because of the uh shock wave and the tsunami or you know a, a wave that uh pushed the dinosaurs and you know so you find a lot of uh, uh plants and animals and stuff because it was like a, a tsunami that killed that dinosaur in that area was deposit right there and, and you can kind of date specific time because of the particles that you find because you use stratification so you you if you find a, a carbon material you can use that carbon to date and and date you know when it happened and then you study the same layer in the area to to date so where is where is he doing the excavating I, I forgot. North Dakota. North Dakota. It's the place that I wanted to visit. Yeah, it's at the Tannis fossil site in okay. North Dakota. Okay, because it being in North Dakota, that's not exactly where you would expect a tsunami from a, um, you know. Remember you that the middle of the country was, uh, the, the continent was, you know, there was a lot of water and the middle of the continent was an uh, inland ocean. Yeah, but I'm, I'm thinking if, if the impact was in the Yucatan, that's a, a quarter of the diameter of the earth, a quarter of the circumference of the earth to get from there to North Dakota. So imagine that the impact, the, the ejecta that fell felt like it turned around the planet and fell back in the same place. I'm, so I'm, okay, like, I'm okay with the ejecta, not quite okay with it being tsunami related. From the original. Yeah, but it destroyed the whole planet. No, because we're still here. Yeah, some stuff in China survived. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you go a little bit down, that is another one that's interesting. So you, you talk about axiom, but if you go down one more after the axiom. Yeah, you, you can, is, uh, you can um, see the, you, the axiom Falcon 9 here and the SLS in the background. This one launched this week. 
this one's going nowhere. Yeah. And uh, the, the next one is the PBS News Hour. Uh, yeah. uh, ancient foot, footprints in New Mexico raise questions about human inhabitants. So it's a short video, but it's one of those excellent stuff that PBS posts. And I watch a lot of uh, PBS video. So this one is super awesome. So you guys should watch that one. And uh, I think related to to uh, science is just that and then the pictures and food that's all I, I think about it is science and food and uh, if if was my brothers uh, watching me saying that here he goes again public TV because yep. <laughs> I got the TV first we only have one TV for us for me and my two brothers and then if I got first, it was on public TV. And they're like, there you go again, public TV. I think it's, it's uh, my part is that. And, and you've got um, uh, Alexa at your house set up where you can say, uh, computer, listen to PBS. Or you no. probably got to narrow down where you can just say, computer, PBS. No, computer, play BBC. Yeah, I forgot to mute the other one. So in my case, uh, C word uh, play BBC and C word play WLRN. Oh, it'll pick WLRN if you just tell it PBS because it always finds yeah. the local affiliate. It's on the internet. What does local have? No, to do? it's like, no, PBS might get something else. I never try PBS because normally when I ask NPR. Yeah. But yeah, uh, I'm always watching the public stuff. It's yep. the most balanced news everywhere in the world. Yeah, yeah I, I just don't like it that they have commercials now. They're kind of commercials. They're commercials yeah. like you might have heard on real radio and TV stations 40 years ago. So they're mild commercials. But relatively few compared to Oh, other yeah. Media. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So it is if um, I'm in a good week, normally I post all the science stuff that I find interesting on my Facebook page. If you want to follow and read up. Yep. And like half of it is about food and the other half is about science. And yeah, food. You, you can science. see that I've read the sciencey ones because I always throw in some off the cuff comment. Yeah. Yeah. How do they know that? <laughs> Oh, uh, Dr. Becky did a very good analysis of uh, Arendelle, the new most distant star that they think they found. And she did come away with an explanation as to how they know it's a star and not a galaxy. Uh, it's too small to be a galaxy, so it must be a star. Really? <laughs> that, that's how they concluded it? It's also the uh, spectroscopic signature. Uh, that's something she did not mention. <laughs> And temperature, too. Well, it's just got to be the color, the energy coming from the star. <laughs> but but then, because I saw that, I went to look for Arendelle. And then from Arendelle, I end up in a, a Lord of the rabbit Rings. hole of Lord of the Rings. Yes, they did that and, deliberately. Yeah. And then I, I, I end up like learning the names of all the rings and yeah, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah rabbit hole of Lord yeah, of there, the Rings. There, there's some data you won't get back out of your brain capacity. <laughs> yes. Okay. Did you check out a potential dark site this past week? Yes. Yes, that's... yes, we did. And I, the best way to describe it is uh, I am in negotiation with Broward Parks Division to get a special use permit for Everglades Holiday Park. Nice. The one stickler at this particular point is the requirement for $2 million of liability insurance. Oh. <laughs> we require Ooh, all our hard. vendors, we require all of our vendors to have that. Yeah, we're, we're a YouTube site. You know, we don't charge membership dues. We've got a small amount coming in from Patreon but it doesn't even cover our annual Zoom costs. I had to go out and look for a discount coupon to get 15% off of our annual Zoom fee. So instead of it being like 150, <laughs> it's uh, 130 something. 
and that's the budget we're running off of. And they, they've gone away and said, um, we'll send you the form once we've prepared it. So I'm hoping they'll have exclusions carved out for it, but I'm in negotiation with them. Maybe sign a liability release. Well, I mean, we do that for um, Kirby Storton, not for Kirby Storton, for Harold Campbell. Um, even though the county um, has a certificate for $2 million from SFAA, um, the South Florida Water Management District also wanted one, but even on top of that liability insurance policy, they require SFAA members that want to be out there as part of a group event to sign a liability waiver. And my thought is, wow. I, can, I can do that for our astronomer participants with mounts. I can do that. I can't expect to do that for the general public that's just attending the event. So there's some discussion left on the table and I indicated to him, you know, if, if that's really a hard and fast rule, then um, Bye. Yeah, ba basically we'll end it here and uh, no hard feelings. It just is what it is. But uh, you lose I, you lose a free service. Yeah, I'm I'm negotiating with them, so we'll, we'll you know see where we go from there. So hello again. Tonight we're going to discuss telescope mount electronics. It's kind of a niche topic, a bit of a technical or nerdy or whatever you want to call it topic. But um, amateur astronomers that want to get into public outreach typically wind up with some kind of capable telescope mount. And uh, this will give you some insights into um, the kinds of models you might want to look at and then uh, the internals of how they basically operate in case you're curious about the innards. Uh, and why some behave some way and others behave other ways. Um, although I've used predominantly ioptron mounts as examples and photographs, um, because that's what I have, and that's the two mounts that I worked on this week, um, the concept should apply to pretty much uh, any brand that's out there. So why this topic? Obviously, because I enjoy um, shouting the praises of the hardware and software minutia of devices including telescope mounts. And I've currently worked on repair actions for two of my mounts that mysteriously broke because they were ignored for the better part of two years. And I found out that the, uh, the basis for them kind of breaking is lubricants being sprayed around the inside over the years of use and then sitting there and hardening and creating uh, electronic bridges and covering encoder disks and bad stuff. So a lot of cleanup. But one of them is, is still exhibiting other problems that I think are a, uh, an integrated circuit heat failure that I may have to get a replacement board for. So by tearing these down, which uh, if we want to discuss right to repair, um, I ignore it when a manufacturer says, no user serviceable parts inside. For me, that's Them's almost fighting words. So uh, if I have a problem with something, I'm more apt to tear it down first and then contact the support team or a uh, uh, user's group to find out something. And I usually end up contributing to the user group some information that they didn't have otherwise um, or to the support team as like, aren't you glad you didn't have to support me through this problem and I diagnosed it myself? Uh, so, but I, I, I have uh, folks that I talk to by email at uh, ioptron and um, one of them's like, oh no, it's him again. And the other one's the other way around, which when he gets an email from me, it's like, oh no, it's him again. <laughs> so, but I have a lot of fun doing those things. I learn a lot. Hopefully they do too. So this presentation serves as my means of logging everything that I figured out uh, to avoid maybe other people by seeing the, the uh, video that I produced from this, avoiding them having to resort to thick books, trying to get a career in telescope mount designs, paying for training classes for it, or without 
knowing what they're doing, tearing down their own personal telescope mounts to figure out what's on the inside. So uh, after I give this, uh, I'd appreciate feedback either from my team during the recording or from those that are viewing the video afterwards. Did I miss something? And, you know, I, I'd rather not hear, yeah, but Celestron does it differently. I, I, you know, that, that's not really going to advance much. Um, did I incorrectly state how something works or why it's done a certain way? That would be much more meaningful. So what is it that this thing called a mount does for us? It basically has two axes of movement and you move it to point at a target. The telescope is attached to the mount and you move the two axes of the mount and you can you know, view a target or take pictures of a target through your telescope. Sometimes you have to push them to that, like a Dobsonian mount, which has no motors, or you can have a, a push to mount where you have indicators that you, you basically want to zero out by you physically moving the telescope, or you do it via motor control. And if you have it via motor control, once you get it to the target, tracking it, basically having at least one motor drive that will very slowly move the telescope so it can hopefully keep the target in the field of view of the eyepiece. So a mount can do this manually or under computer control of its motors. But first, if it's going to do it either as a push to or a go to with motors, it's got to know what's the location of the target. Then it needs to know how fast it can move to that target. Um, it has at least one motor to track the target if it's an equatorial mount. Uh, but we can get into using two motors, which is the most predominant approach. And you can fall into using two motors simply because your equatorial mount's not lined up properly. Uh, and then once you have a mount that's doing all this stuff for you, you can connect the computer to it, find things in your planetarium software or in catalogs, and then tell the uh, mount to slew to that and start tracking it. That's ultimately where you'd like to get to, because then you can do photography. So first thing we have to do is communicate the location. There's basically two ways of doing this. There is horizontal, which is the proverbial altitude and azimuth, or uh, altitude is also referred to sometimes as elevation. And that's from the horizon at zero degrees to zenith at 90 degrees. And azimuth is North is zero degrees, and if you rotate around going east, around to south, and then to west, and then back to north again, it's 360 degrees. The other uh, primary means of pointing the mount is through equatorial. This is where the um, one of the axes of rotation is lined up with the um, pole of rotation of the Earth on its axis. And the other axis is just a positive and negative 90 degrees above or below the ecliptic. So now, now that you know, well, kind of the, the unit measure of these two pointing systems, um, there are others. There's galactic and intergalactic and just bigger and bigger pictures of the same thing. Um, there are catalogs out there. Some of these catalogs are historical, which I think of it more like hysterical because the catalog that is one of the oldest is called the New General Catalog, the NGC, but it dates back earlier than the 1800s. Um, and there are some that are updated periodically over time, like the uh, Tycho Catalog. Some catalogs are even accessible on the internet. Uh, if you ever go look it up, you can look up Simbad out of uh, France, and you can tell it to find the name of anything, or you can give it the coordinates for something, and it'll show you everything that's available in that area. Uh, NASA has a, a lovely one on high energy um, astronomical objects. These are like gamma and X-ray targets. Uh, NED will find those for you. So those are more easily pointing uh, radio telescopes, but they're on the same kind of mount. These kinds of catalogs will give you equatorial coordinates that you can then map based upon your observing location and date and time. But there are also catalogs of 
Earth orbiting objects, satellites. NORAD has kind of the world class one, but there are private ones like Celeste Track. Uh, that will give you the orbital parameters, which you then run through calculations with your observing location and your date time, and it'll predict the sky location at a particular date time for that satellite. So, yeah, if you sort of stop time, then you can translate that to a, uh, an ecliptical uh, uh, or equatorial um, position, but it's really better to work those as altitude and azimuth, which change over time. So the idea is to take whatever coordinates you have for something, map it to what the software wants internally to your mount, realizing that ultimately it's going to have to rotate two motors, and the motors don't care from that stuff. They just want to know degrees of rotation. So how do you go about mapping these uh, coordinate systems to um, essentially uh, degrees rotation for uh, mount movement? Um, the motors inside the mount only move in one of two directions, and each motor can move plus or minus in both of these directions. So they don't know from RA or DEC or altitude or azimuth. They just know clockwise or counterclockwise off of maybe an index mark or counting the number of pulses um, from an encoder. So if your mount has servo motors in it, they'll spin at a certain speed over time, and it requires an encoder to, as the motor turns, go pulse, 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 pulse at a rate defined by the encoder's tick marks that are usually optically sensed or uh, magnetically sensed. And uh, that tells you how fast the motor is moving. And as a result of that, you know where you started from and you know where you want to be and you know you're not there yet. So you keep applying power to the motor until you get a sufficient number of ticks. If you have a stepper motor, as it applies power, no power, power, no power, it will rotate the motor clockwise or counterclockwise by a defined number of degrees per step. And it's usually fractions of a degree. And you, you basically pulse, 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 pulse in a positive or negative direction to rotate a stepper motor. And based upon the number of steps, how many degrees you've rotated it. But that's just the motor turning. You now have to move a bigger object a longer distance. And you do this by uh, gearing up things. So what you need to do is take the small motor, and I've got a picture of that that I'll come up to soon, um, a small motor with a small shaft with a gear on the end of it that then drives a bigger gear to drive a bigger gear to translate that high speed RPM into very high torque to move the mount. So the very high speed of these small motors is that whining or whirring noise that you hear in a telescope mount. And because the motor has a metal shaft and the metal shaft is on a metal gear, which translates to a bigger, usually aluminum metal gear, that's how you get all that whining noise is the motor movement just gets translated to a big hunk of metal and it radiates the sound. It, uh, you might find it irritating. Some of them are high pitched, some of them are low pitched, depends upon the mount design. Um, it might be irritating at events where you're sharing time with other astronomers. You know, why is your mount so loud or why is it so high pitched? My brand is easier on the ears. Uh, different brands. Uh, but if you're doing this from your house, it might also keep your neighbors up at night. What's that noise? Yeah. But you can make design considerations in your mount that will reduce this noise and will reduce the pitch of the noise by how you shape the gears or whether it's holes in it or such. So once you get to the course direction of where you want to point, you now have to do a fine pointing or a uh, tracking. And now you're moving that same motor because you're not changing motors between slewing and tracking. It's the same motor moving at a much slower speed. So it changes it from a high pitched whine to either a buzzing or a grinding 
periodic noise like nye, 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 at a high rate or a low rate depending upon the tracking speed. Generally, you don't worry about you know design considerations on that. Your mid mount sounded like a modem. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, my smaller ioptron mounts actually sound like old style acoustic coupled modems as. Now, as to the gearing, so um, the first level of gearing on the motor is apt to be a small diameter, either a belt uh, or a, uh, a worm gear to get the big wheel turning, and it'll either uh, do that directly. Uh, you can either have the uh, the motors 90 degrees, or you can have the motors linear to the gear. And if they're linear, you don't need any further assist. If they're 90 degrees, you need something to take the 90 degrees and make it back to linear with the main gear. So that's how you wind up with things like uh, belted gears and such. Uh, some say the belt reduces the jitter. Others say the belt over time can stretch and implies plasticity in the movement different, you know, these things aren't perfect. Just think of it as you've got one motor and when you're slewing, you want to move it very fast. And as you start to get to your target, you suddenly want to take that same motor and move it very slowly. So your, your awareness in the software of how far the motor is turning every time you apply power to it or step it is your means of saying, do I want to go fast or slow? How many times do I want to turn that motor to make the big wheels a turn it? So to save on parts and support costs, the same types and sizes of motors and encoders are used for both motors, even though you need to move them at different rates and for different distances. But uh, you may find that the, uh, the big gear or the worm gear will actually have a different number of teeth per degree based upon how far it needs to move. Think of it as uh, the equatorial or RA needs to move through essentially 12 hours above the horizon, 12 hours below the horizon. You can't look down there. And uh, the declination needs to move plus or minus 90 degrees. But as soon as you flip that around and say, now I want to run it in altitude azimuth or horizon-based pointing, uh, now I've got 360 and I've got zero to 90. So that changes, you know, how big the gears need to be and how many teeth they need to have. In pitches, I got pitches. Mm -hmm. So this is the uh, uh, innards of the declination or um, altitude slash elevation drive of my ioptron IEQ 45. So in the picture on the left, need my mouse over there. There's the mouse. This is the gear on the drive motor, and you can see a belt that has teeth in it, and you can see gears that have teeth in it. These are relatively small. Uh, the gear diameter is about as big as my, the the top knuckle of my thumb, and it rotates and drives the other gear, which is the same number of teeth, same diameter gear. They're identical gears and it's going to rotate the worm gear, which is halfway down this shaft, and then the worm gear rotates and turns this big gear here, which is uh, several inches across, that drives the actual um, declination or altitude movement of the mount. So this is the belt side or the pulley side. Uh, this is the, others, the other end of the mo motors. You can see it's just a bearing, a thrust bearing for the um, the uh, uh, worm gear, and then here's the back end of the motor. And this plastic cover uh, uh, has the electrical power to the servo motor, and it also has the uh, optical encoder gear, uh, the optical encoder disc uh, in this plastic enclosure so that lubricant won't get on it like their other mount models. And uh, you've got six wires down here. I've asked him, can you give me the pin out of this thing? So far, it's like crickets. And this cable goes over to the circuit board, and the circuit board connects into 
a bunch of stuff here. This is the connection for the uh, deck or alt drive back to the main circuit board. This is the connector that goes to the drive motor and the encoder. These are the three uh, high current switching transistors. They're called MOSFETs. They're field effect transistors. There's three of them here. I don't know why you need three of them because these are quads. That means 12. So I think to increase the current rather than having a, a big chip, a big MOSFET, they've got three cheap little MOSFETs and they gang them up. So they switch on three of them to drive, you know, more current. Um, this is conditioning circuitry for the electronics. This is the actual voltage regulator. And then up here, look at that, a microprocessor. They have a separate microprocessor for each of the um, altitude and azimuth or right ascension and declination drives. And you can see the crystal oscillator for running the microprocessor. Now you might think they'd put a cheap micro there, but in order to make the microprocessor fast enough, they actually have a full 32-bit microprocessor here. Now you can buy these for under 10 bucks a piece in quantity thousands. And it's got a little buffer circuitry here to drive these MOSFETs. But that's one of these two circuit boards. There's another one that looks almost identical, and I, I can fault Ioptron by, why didn't you make them the same? Because the encoders are different, and they have a split connector on the other one. Okay, I don't know why they did that, but two different boards. This is the board that went, this, actually the board you see here is upside down. It really wants to be with the parts facing down. And when I face it with parts down, it goes flaky after getting warmed up. When I face it with the parts up and the cover off, it seems to work just fine. So my guess is one of these three chips right here, when it starts to get warm from use, it goes flaky and the motor stops. That's what I have to diagnose. So gears are not perfect. So when you mesh two gears together, you can think of it as a, a set of fingers interlacing with another set of fingers. And when you do that and you rotate one, you're essentially pushing the other gear. And when you do that, it's kind of like build up force and it rotates. And as it rotates, it slips up over the gears and back down again. And when it's going up, it needs force this way. And when it slips down, now the force is on the other side and it can slide back a little bit. Uh, so you have these effects in gearing. Also, as you go around the gears, they may not be perfectly you know, symmetrical in every gear tooth. Some of the gear teeth may be a little off in their shape. So we have these things called periodic error correction. Every time I come to that same tooth, it's a little off, so I have to push a little different, or, you know, the, the backlash will be a little different. So in a mount, you can actually store these known uh, pressure offsets around the main gears, and that's called periodic error correction. Uh, but you also have, well, as the mount is moving the telescope and it goes from over on this side of the mount to over on this side of the mount, it actually flips the mass. So now instead of pushing the mass up the hill, you're pulling the mass down the hill. And when you do that, you can have a slip in the gears. It's not that it actually comes out. It's just a little bit of back pressure, and that back pressure is called backlash. So when you go to move it and you stop moving it, it kind of like, ah, it falls a little bit. That's backlash. And you can generally adjust this value in your mount. So now we get into generations of mounts. I won't go into all the text here. This is if people want to pause the video and read it. I will show you this. Pitches. So early on, mounts had what is known as a single access right ascension motor. There was no real computers. It was analog uh, electro electrical circuitry, and you could adjust the speed. And all it would do was drive your right ascension drive to track the target you were looking at. And by default, it would give you your um, ecliptic transiting speed. So as a star moved, as a galaxy or a nebula or a um, star moved across the sky, 
it would stay in the eyepiece of your telescope or in your camera's view. The problem is um, planets don't quite move like that. They move a little different. And the moon moves quite a bit different because it's orbiting the Earth. Um, so you had to be able to adjust the speed with a knob faster or slower, but there were no like tick marks to tell you, I want it on uh, sidereal speed, or I want it on solar speed, or I want it on lunar speed. And then when you got to asteroids, comets, and satellites, like all bets were off, you just sort of played with it until it stayed in the eyepiece. And also for those people that are above or below the equator, depending upon which direction you wanted the motor to move, you had a north-south indicator. So that was how things started. And you could generally buy the mount for cheap and then decide later you want to do an add-on and you could, um, on brackets, attach the motor and the hand controller. And uh, you see power going to the controller, which goes down this white cable to the drive motor. Where's the computer interface? What computer interface? That's why you've got these things here. These uh, dials with all the numbers on them, those are called setting circles. You would go look up the coordinates of your target and you would unlock the motor, manually rotate the mount until it was pointed in the correct direction based upon you doing a polar alignment initially. And then you would lock the right ascension drive and then turn on the motor unit and it would track the object. There was no real push to, there was no go to whatsoever. It was kind of like, you move to. Uh, the next generation up from that was things like the Sky Commander, which I learned still kind of exists. He's still uh, working on those. This one was a little different. It could tell by encoders how fast you were moving the two axes of your mount. So you could tell the Sky Commander where you were, date and time, and the target you wanted, and added a couple of catalogs loaded into the Sky Commander, like planets usually, and you say, I want to go to Jupiter. And it would give you two values, one for your right ascension and one for your declination, and you would unlock your mount and then push the mount until you saw the number zero out in one direction, and you would lock that axis, and then you would push the other axis until it zeroed out, and you would lock that, and once you did that, you would tell it, okay, track. And then it would slowly move the motors to uh, just track. So the motors were really weak, and there was no uh, movement of the mount other than tracking. And you could tell it to move at different speeds, but it was pushed to to get there, no actual go-to slewing. And uh, once you get there, it was very basic tracking. No GPS. Uh, no high performance motors. So next up you'd see, and this is a Celestron hand paddle, um, the beginnings of go-to mounts. And they would have things like a two line, 16 character display with lots of abbreviations and lots of horizontal scrolling that you could adjust the speed on. And that's still popular today as an inexpensive form of hand paddle. Uh, that's the, my hand paddle. Yes. There's a company in China that is actually the owner to a lot of that technology, and you can find similar but not completely identical hand paddles loaded with basically the same software with different brands on it. Uh, but that way, the people that make the mounts and the telescopes don't have to worry about all that computer stuff. They don't have to build special hardware. They could just pay a branding fee to have their name put on it. And then the problem you is that the program is incomplete and I lost some features in my, com my telescope. Yeah, um, the way that the software for most mounts is done is the mount manufacturer will contract out, even Celestron does this, will contract out to a third party vendor to rebadge some off the shelf software to run the mount. And then they'll test it and they'll verify it works and that'll kind of like put a cap on it, end of contract, don't have to pay the developer anymore, and they'll do very limited support on it. And if you want to add features, oh, you should go buy our new product. But if you download the software that is an upgrade for your existing older mount, 
it may behave differently. It may break it. Uh, you might lose features as Helen lost on hers. Um, and there may be different firmware based upon which generational model of mount you're working with. Um, I have an iOptron IEQ45. It's my go-to mount. It's a go-to mount, but it's my go-to mount for moving my heavier telescopes. And when they first came out with that, it used uh, servo motors. Then they came along later and changed it to stepper motors. So they have to have different software, different firmware for the motor drives. So they've got two different versions of the software that have the same version number because they're based on the same source code, but they behave differently based upon whether it's servo or stepper motors. So you got to make sure you load the right stuff because if you load the wrong stuff, it ain't going to work. So uh, you have to deal with that kind of stuff as you, the poor owner, just trying to get a mount to work. And then you have the outliers like Ioptron that went, hey, this hardware is actually cheaper than you think it is. And they had people that understood how software works. So they came out with an eight line by 24 character display where you can actually read things. And you can see that it's longitude west, 71 degrees, eight minutes, 49 seconds. And you can see northern hemisphere. So it, it took things up a notch where you could actually communicate a lot more information. And so it made it plausible to run both right ascension declination and altitude azimuth in the same mount at the same time. But for those older mounts that still worked in equatorial, you have to line things up off of Polaris. Some people have the misconception that I'll just line it up on Polaris. You'll be close, but no cigar because Polaris is not the true north pole of rotation of Earth. It's offset from it. So you have to do that. And once you do that, now you've got to line it up on a couple of stars to judge whether or not you're truly aligned. Because if you're not truly aligned, you may have to go to your first alignment star and align on it, go to your second alignment star, align on it, and then it's kind of right, but eventually it drifts out. So what you actually want to do is go to your, you know, tell the mount to go to your first alignment star. And if it's off, don't use your go-to buttons to correct the alignment. Unlock the mount and move it there if your mount allows you to do that. And then lock it back. And that's all you have to do in both axes. Um, I'm very used to doing that for my Ioptron mount. But I know some mounts, once you get them moving, they kind of like, take stepper motor control over the mount, and you can't unlock them as long as the power is applied. Um, so for an azimuth mount, um, if, if you've got a, a GPS on board, all you really need to know is date, time, location, tilt, and compass orientation, and star alignment's not really needed because the math works. Um, and some Altitude azimuth mounts that are made by a certain company whose brand name begins with a C um, still have you do multiple star alignments, even though it's an altitude azimuth mount and it's not really necessary because you paid for a GPS receiver to be added on. It's because they have a patent and unless they use their patent, they lose their patent. So yeah, them's the uh, mount business. So what is this equatorial alignment stuff? Well, this is what you have to actually do with a uh, equatorial mount. You have to do this every time you set it up, unless it's permanently installed on a pier in a dome. If you take it out to a site, you have to do this every time. You have to line up the um, uh, one of the axes with the north pole of rotation, which is near but not exactly on Polaris. Now, sometimes there'll actually be a, a second small telescope built into that axis of the mount called a polar scope. And sometimes you can even put a camera on that. And what it will have in it is this kind of an image. It'll say, hey, on this side of the sky is the Big Dipper. On this side of the sky is Cassiopeia. And 
the star patterns and the points of light uh, will actually be at the correct magnification for the distance between these two constellations. And then dead center is the cross. And you want to put Polaris in this circle around the outside edge. And where Polaris is, is relative to the time of day for your location as to where Polaris will be on that circle. So that's what you have to do every time you set up your equatorial mount. Now, some guys do this so fast and are so adept at it, they don't even make a mental note of it. They just do it as a course of business. And um, if you ask him about it as a new telescope owner, what's all this frustration I'm having with polar alignment? They'll go, I don't know what you're talking about. Because it's in, it's embedded and in, it's embedded in their mount setup. That you're like, okay, throw in another five or 10 minutes to get your polar alignment done and you're good to go for the night. But you don't have to do that with uh, smarter mounts that have a uh, GPS in them. So we're going to focus on computerized go-to mounts, not manual mounts, and not push-to mounts. And we're going to look at uh, basically what you need for a medium weight mount. So not the very lightweight mounts that can you know, leave off a few bits and pieces, and not the very heavyweight mounts, which everything is a huge metal mass and gearing and very expensive for your wallet. So we'll stick with the mid-range. Now, mid doesn't mean small, um, you know, a mount that can move a telescope plus its accessories that is greater than 13 pounds, but somewhat less than 70 pounds total. And you only want to load, load up the mount um, to about eh, 50 to 75 percent of its rated carry weight for it to move uh, with the most reliability. So should your choice be equatorial or altasma, um, you know, polar or horizontal? If you're going to be doing public outreach where you're not doing long duration astrophotography, I would definitely highly recommend altitude azimuth with a uh, built-in GPS to give you location date and time. It makes mount setup oh so much faster. And if your mount works, uh, oh so much faster. And also, it's good for the azimuth that to have the the rubber thingy, the step motor, because some kids just grab. I don't see it. And if you have gears, you're gonna, you know, mess up your telescope. It's gonna break. Well, um, I've fought with that over the years with the ioptron mounts, and um, my IEQ 45 mount has um, servo motors with a belt drive. So once it's engaged, they can hang on that scope all day long. It might move a little bit, but it's not going to come open and unlocked and such. But the uh, the cube style and the mini tower style, they have a clutch lock that opens up if you push your head on the eyepiece or if a kid hangs on the eyepiece. It literally unlocks and just goes vertical. So what I do is when I align the telescope, I balance it so that the back end of the telescope is slightly heavy. So it will go vertical, but it won't go over the top and smack them in the head. But uh, I have definitely complained to Ioptron about that. And they've made some minor changes. And I actually bought the, uh, the hardware changes, uh, mechanical hardware, not electronics, but mechanical hardware changes to make the gearing tighter to try and avoid that. But then you get people who press their head against the eyepiece. And when the target is no longer in focus, they think the solution to the problem is press their head even, high, even tighter. And they're going to defeat that. And the longer the telescope, the more they're going to defeat it. So I just like, OK, this is what you got to deal with. But um, if you have a GPS receiver and uh, altitude azimuth mount that integrates that, you can be good to go without any polar alignment at any location, have no ability to see Polaris. You can do it in the daytime. You can see planets in the daytime. This is contemporary mount technology is the best way to describe it. But if you want to do long duration astrophotography, it is definitely better to have an equatorial or polar mount. 
because then you don't have rotation of your field of view. Now, I'm going to call it a stand. Different people call it different things. There's tripods, there's piers and mobile piers, there's fixed location piers, but it's basically if you want to move if you want to move your telescope around out in the field, um, I, re I recommend a uh, tripod with a uh, tube diameter of at least two inches to make it nice and sturdy. Um, two inches is also 50 millimeters in case you're looking for that. Um, the way in which the mount head or the upper mechanical parts of it connects to the stand or tripod or pier um, can either be a bolt up through the center or it can be bolts down through the top. Typically when it's bolts down through the top, um, you'll also have the ability to do um, what a surveyor does on a theodolite, which is it, they give you three bolts that you can screw up and down to very small degree adjust the tilt of the mount head. I found that uh, works really well on my um, IEQ 45 because I can just plop down the mount, get a basic level on it, and then put on the mount head. And if it's a little off, tweak the knobs a little bit, and now it's perfectly level. And also by piggybacking on the theodolite tripods, they're probably going to come in cheaper to be you know, sturdy than if you had a telescope-specific heavier tripod. So here's the two. Here is a um, tripod on the left. Now, this is one of the oh. holds up the middle types. And then on the right, you have a pier. But notice that you don't have anything on top of the pier between the pier top and the mount bottom. And the bolts come in from the top. So this one's not dynamically adjustable. You have to go down to the knobs on the bottom down here and adjust the tilt of the top of your pier. And when you have a heavy mount sitting with a heavy telescope on it, a slight adjustment on this is uh, a physical challenge. So it's the best way to describe it. So as I was saying early on, what does the telescope mount have to do? It literally has to take location information of your target, move the two axes using motors to your target, and then track it at a certain rate. But once you get there, um, you may want to slightly nudge, you might want to slightly nudge the, um, the mount in order to keep your target in the center. And this nudging can be done externally using something called a guiding interface. The guiding interface is usually based upon a second telescope, smaller diameter, um, that's just looking at a star. And when it sees that star moving as a pixel or fraction of pixel, it will uh, send in the opposite direction a nudge, like a joystick movement nudge, uh, over an interface called an ST4. And it'll move it up, down, left, to right to keep the edge of that star aligned with the current view of the telescope. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the thing the telescope is looking at may actually be different than the guide star. The guide star can be in a slightly different part of the sky, but the closer you can get that guide star to the center of the field of view of what you're looking at, the more they'll, you won't have any parallax issues, the more they'll be um, collinear. And if your camera that you're doing your astrophotography with has an SD4 interface, but your mount doesn't, then you might have to get a USB adapter for the SD4, plug it in your laptop, and then drive it out through your mount. Um, there's some software that can do that for you if you're missing that interface. So here's what an SD4 guider looks like. It's kind of a simplish uh, looking beast. Uh, this is one that goes to a USB. So it's a USB cable. You can see the, the larger connector here. That's the device interface that plugs into the back end of the adapter. And you have a, a normal USB interface that plugs into your computer. It's an original first generation style. It's not like USB-C. And then you have this six wire RGA kind of phone cord looking thing that plugs into the ST connector of this adapter. And then it plugs into the ST connector on your mount. And it's 
very simple. It's, it's just uh, analog power circuits. So you have no connection, ground, and then you have power connections of, am I pulsing it in RA up or RA down, deck up or deck down? Now, how do you get power to the mount? I'll go away from all the word. I'll, I'll leave it on the words for a while so people can pause if they really want to read through all that stuff. But suffice it to say, here's the power progression. We started out with car batteries, with uh, jumper cables, going to cigarette lighter plugs, going to uh, round screw-on power connectors, and that was just a lot of, why are we making it so difficult on ourselves? We then went to car jump start batteries, and you can see that they have uh, uh, cigarette lighter plugs, so you'll then make an adapter, it will plug into your mount using like a, a small barrel plug or a circular or whatever proprietary to your, to your mount power connection is. And that's how you'll get your power, 12 volts DC. Then we moved up to lithium polymer jumpstart batteries. So this is essentially performing the same function, but instead of having a couple of large lead acid batteries in the basis, they're usually motorcycle batteries. Um, they'll have one lithium ion battery or for more power they'll have a stack of two lithium ion batteries joined together and then they'll have this connector called an ec5 connector that uh, you'll then either use that for your jumper cables or you'll do what i did which was hand wire up something that had ec5 on one end and a barrel plug that plugged directly into my mount on the other and these are usually small enough batteries you can put some velcro in the back of them and literally just whack it onto the side of your telescope mount head so you had no power cable dragging off from your mount, which was pretty good. And then you got smart and said, I want to have computers out there and my laptop. And, and they came up with these fancy devices that for about 200 bucks, you can have eh, what would be normally a five to $700 gasoline power generator. And the way you look at that is, if I have this device at home and I charge it up, what is the power duration equivalent to a gasoline power generator that I fill up before leaving the house and I you know, run these to exhaustion? Well, about eight hours. So your gasoline generator will give you about eight hours. On your normal loads, this will give you about eight hours. Of course, as soon as you start doing things like well, instead of getting a low voltage adapter for your laptop, which normally runs at 19 volts, you want to power it by 115 volts AC at, you know, three amps. Well, that's obviously going to put a bigger draw on it. But if you get a 12 volt adapter for your laptop and your mount has a 12 volt barrel adapter, you just need a one to one barrel plug to barrel plug. And now you can run it for eight hours. But it's also got a cigarette letter jack. And for your phone, it's got, you know, USB charging and all that stuff. On the back side of this box, there's an ungodly bright white LED array. If you really want to use it as, you know, a deity's flashlight. <laughs> but that's the progression. We went from big, heavy, lasting only about three years to having their own battery management supply. And this is not a uh, lithium uh, heavy metal battery. This is a lithium iron phosphate battery. So we can go to 100% charge and stay on 100% charge in your house all the time until you need it. And you can draw it down to zero if you want it and then charge it back up, which is the beauty of a lithium iron phosphate battery over an older lithium po uh, polymer battery that has cobalt and nickel in it. So now what are all, all the other connectors on the mount? Well, you've obviously got your hand controller or your hand box or your hand paddle also abbreviated as APX. You've got the external computer where you're going to run your software for your imaging or your planetarium software. That can hook up as RS-232 or USB or Ethernet or wireless or maybe even Bluetooth. Um, you've got your cables to go from one part of your mount to another part of your mount, typically from the main computer up to your RA and your deck drives, or it'll maybe have your, your RA drive and your main computer together and you'll just have a cable going up to your deck drive. You've got that guider cable. And 
if you do have an equatorial scope that has a polar scope, in order for you to see that reticle, that pattern of the constellations and where Polaris is, um, you might have a little red LED inside of that scope to make it easier to see that reticle. Um, the power input for these kinds of mounts is typically going to be a uh, five millimeter barrel jack uh, at a few amperes, like you know two or three amps. But there's newer technology on the horizon. There is an international standard for Ethernet for LANs called Power Over Ethernet uh, Plus Plus, or as the standards evolve, for PPOE, which will give you um, up to 48 volts DC and up to 90 watts of power, more than you could ever use with your laptop, your camera, your guide, maybe not your guide camera as well, but the mount, all that stuff could be powered over. One power connection would also be your data connection to your to your your uh, mount. So if you're going to be doing a dome, that's you know what what you should be looking at doing, because then you have one cable that does it all. Now let's talk about that hand controller. Uh, it may be a wireless hand controller. It may be a, a proprietary wired hand controller, or it could be a an app on your mobile phone. But it'll basically have some kind of menu or mode selection for you to be able to tell it what you want to do. It'll have buttons or a keypad for adjusting values or for entering like the numeric coordinates directly or for selecting how fast you want it to run. It could have um, uh, illuminated buttons and an illuminated display where you can adjust the brightness and contrast of it. Uh, there could be a separate LED on the back side of the hand controller for just using to like look at what, what is the focal length of this eyepiece little light. Of course, it'll have a stop button for safety, like uh, it's gone haywire, stop. It could have a tell me what the current status is or a help button so you can figure out how to use it, plus a full display of you know what you're trying to go to, its coordinates, how far it's moved, what it's got left to move, uh, and any um, modes of operation, you know, what time zone you're in, are you above or below the equator, all that data. It's kind of hard to put all that data in a two-line display. You may have a lot of menu selections. But it can also tell you nifty stuff like, what's the version of the firmware in my mount? And it may be multiple values for different parts of your mount. But all that stuff is your interaction through the hand paddle or the device app on your phone. Here it is. This is the um, 8407 Plus hand controller for my IEQ45 AZ non-pro, meaning it has servo motors, not steppers. There's a lot of stuff here. So on the left, you see the entire hand paddle, and it, you know, that long part of the hand paddle fits in your hand nicely. Uh, and you have very obvious up, down, left, right buttons for direction. You don't have to go. Is it these buttons or those buttons like you do on the Celestron? Um, you have a button that's for menu, called menu. And if you want to step up and down the menus, you can use the uh, up and down, left and right buttons, or you can go back up a menu level. So it's, it's somewhat intuitive. And then you have the light button for the little LED on the back side of the hand paddle to let you use it to light up your eyepiece so you can see where things are. You have an emergency stop button, and you have the question mark, which given the amount of stuff they can show you on the display, this is the normal, like current status display that it always puts up, where it's currently pointing, whether the motors are running or not, whether the GPS is on or has a fix, it'll say okay here. The target right ascension and declination, the current right ascension and declination, and the current altitude and asthma, the local date and time, uh, and whether or not you're, um, you're above or below the equator. This is north. The current speed, 64x is your slew rate, and um, it's in altitude azimuth mode as opposed to equatorial. So lots of useful information. It's dynamically updating, uh, probably about every tenth of a second. So good stuff, that. Now, when you're moving the heavy mass of a telescope, it needs to be balanced. So when you slap that telescope into the bracket, 
so the mount can move it, you want to make sure that you unlock the mount and you put the telescope in, and then you kind of like make sure it's got a, a good center of mass because otherwise, as the telescope wants to move and it gets beyond a certain point, you're moving a very heavy mass against it. So you want it kind of in the center. So it's, it's kind of like an elevator. If you think of an elevator, an elevator has these counterweights. And the counterweights make it where you can have relatively small motors to move the enormous mass of the elevator car with all the people in it versus the up and down weights of the elevator. Same thing on your mount. You want it balanced so that it takes very little motor movement to move it slowly as it's tracking things. And to keep that balanced, not only do you want it at the correct position in the bracket, you also want to look at the other axis and balance that as well. But how much you put on the mount, what are the mount's rating is? If the mount says, uh, you know, it can support 30 pounds, eh, I'd say 20 pounds tops, but you'd probably want it around 10 pounds. So you want a little heftier mount than what you're actually going to put in it because then you're not overstressing anything and it can very spritefully move things at high speed and very easily move the mass when it's tracking. But you've got to add up all those weights um, in order to know how much weight the motors have to move. So when you want to move things that are heavy precisely, you have to have the software do stuff like uh, if it's just sitting there, you have to have the motor apply its maximum current to essentially disrupt the inertia of the telescope just sitting there. And you kind of like have to move it up that first tooth on the, the gearing. So lots of energy to do that. But once you get it rolling, now you can back down on the amount of power um, and you, you literally get a mass moving. And then when you want to slow it down, you may have to actually apply a little bit of power in the opposite direction to reinstate the inertia of it just sitting still. That's why when you um, slew your mount, you'll actually hear it go wind up to a high pitch and then it kind of slows down, slows down, slows down. And then you hear it go eh, 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 and move just a little bit. And it may actually move backwards a little bit. Um, it can actually quickly move past the target and then move backwards a little bit to compensate for that. So the telescope mount power circuitry has to actually deal with all of these uh, masses and power adjustments as it's moving things. And it needs to deal with all that other stuff I talked about earlier, like backlash and periodic error correction. And if you have the wrong kind of mount, then you have to deal with things called slop, where it's, there's a lot of play in it. It wasn't a go-to mount, but the Brandon telescope mechanism at Fox Observatory has a lot of slop in the right ascension mechanism. And that's just, it's been that way all along. And that was just how telescope mounts were in the 1920s. So servo motors versus steppers. A servo, you apply power, it moves at, it, it will try and move at its top speed based upon the power. Um, and you need something else on the shaft of the motor to spin and essentially click off movement to let you know how fast the motor is moving and how far it's moved since you started with the power. This is the least expensive drive unit as the motors are very simple DC bi-directional motors. So you apply positive and negative, moves one way. You apply negative and positive, moves the other way. Very simple. But once you stop applying the power, it's free to move. The motor is not going to be holding it in place. Stepper motors, on the other hand, they only move a certain amount every time you apply power. And it's basically interlocking step, 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 step. And as the motor turns, it moves along the steps. So when you remove the power, it just sits there. It's not going to move. You can't move it. It's locked in. But you have to understand where you were and how many steps you've given it to know where it currently is. There's no encoder. It's just presumed based upon the motor's precision rotation. So it's a little more complicated, but you get that built-in locking mechanism. And as I mentioned, the gearing, um, 
both axes start with a small motor moving at a high speed, driving some kind of worm gear or small gear to make a big gear move. And you can move it at a different speed based upon whether you're slewing or um, guiding. Uh, rotation through 360 degrees stops in cords. So if you imagine an altitude azimuth mount and you say, I want to go there and you go there and the cord you know, extends out, maybe it's a coiled stretchy cord and extends out to a certain distance and you're on a target. And you say, I want to go over there. And it continues moving the mount in the same direction, azimuth, uh, and the cord stretches out further. And you say, I want to go over there. And the cord stretches out even further. At some point, the cord is going to want to wrap around the mount. And you generally have an option called cord wrap. That when you turn on cord wrap, it will go a certain degrees azimuth. And then if you go a little further, it'll say, fine, no problem. The cord will go that far, no issue. But if you say, now I want to go even further, it'll say, wait a minute, let's get at that from the other side. And it'll actually subtract that out of 360 degrees and come at it from the other direction so that the cord doesn't wrap itself around the mount head. And that's called cord wrap. Some mounts, usually the ones that have stepper motors, have stops in them. They're usually a pin that's sticking up that they use as an index to say, um, I'm not going to let you go more than 360 degrees in any rotation because then you'll hit the stop. And it uses the stop to say, well, when I'm at the stop, I'm through 359.59 degrees. So if I swing it back all the way the other way to the stop, now I'm at zero degrees. So you use the stop as your means of giving you an index um, of where you're at. Uh, servo motors don't really have that. You align them up, you let them run, and they can, they can do you know, 720, no problem, whatever you want. Um, and if you look at the display, you actually watch the, the position go positive, negative, positive. So for alignment of equatorial mounts, you'll sometimes hear this thing called plate solving. Uh, if you take a picture of the brighter stars in a particular part of the sky and you have software that knows what those patterns should look like in that direction from your location at that date and time, kind of like little planetarium software, then you can say, well, that's how it should be lined up and you're not quite lined up. So you need to unlock your mount and move it a little this way. So that's called plate solving. But a lot of the plate solving cameras and software want to do it easily like Polaris. Um, well, what if you can't see Polaris because there's trees or buildings in the way? Well, some of the plate solving software will let you choose an alternate view and you can point it overhead or towards the east or west horizon and do a different image. Well, what if the place you want to set up is downtown somewhere and there's so much light pollution that of the you know 20 stars it thought it could see it can see three uh it could guess wrong or it could time out and give up so plate solving works really great for dark sites for equatorial mounts when you can see whatever target you're using for your plate solving but it's not a universal solution towards getting an equatorial mount easily lined up. So how do you determine date time? Well, everybody's heard of GPS. Well, GPS is what the US calls it. Internationally or multinationally, it's referred to as the Global Navigation Satellite System or GNSS. And every country has their own. Um, Russia's is called Glasnost. Uh, China's is called Baidu. Uh, the UK's is called, anyway, the UK has their own and I've forgotten what it's called. Um, but anyway, a modern GPS receiver can within fractions of a second, if it's uh, ever gotten a, a lock before, it can tell you your current location down to less than 50 feet and current time of day accurate to small fractions of a second. 
because instead of just receiving GPS satellites, a GNSS receiver can receive all of the international positioning satellites. So if the GPS satellites are, now there's three of them overhead right now. If you expand that out to GNS, GNSS satellites, you may find that there's 16 of them overhead right now. So it gets a much faster fix. And it actually remembers all the orbital parameters of all the satellites that it learns. So when you first turn it on, it's called a cold start. And it learns the orbital characteristics of the satellites because the satellites actually communicate that. And if your GPS receiver is smart enough to know how to decode that, it can actually store in flash memory in the receiver, in the GPS receiver, the orbital parameters of all the satellites. So not only does it sense the satellites that are currently overhead, it can predict which satellites are going to next be overhead and which satellites are about to disappear over the horizon. So with that information, you can not only determine your location, you can determine which direction you're pointing because you know which satellites are going to be gaining signal as they come up and which satellites are going to be losing signal as they go away. And based upon the signal to noise ratio of those changing, you know which direction your receiver is pointing. It's kind of cool. They didn't have to add anything for that. They just went, what if we made the software smarter? Now that we can, you know, have 16 satellites to work from and we've got all the orbital characteristics of them, let's just use that. The last thing you want to use for your mount is what they put on the display, which is your local time. Local time is great for human beings, but for electronics and telescope mounts that need Greenwich Mean Time or Universal Coordinated Time, or UTC, it's much better that the mount internally work everything off of UTC, and then you tell it what the offset is, and it can provide for human minds um, the geopolitical time zone offset. Uh, if you ever look at a time zone map, um, there's actually a video on YouTube for this. Um, central time zone, there is a city that is towards the easternmost portion of central time zone that is the farthest point from the center of that time zone. And then in the west, in Texas, I think it's Lubbock, there's a city in Texas that is the farthest from the center of that time zone. So you can be on central time and expect the sun to be directly overhead at noon. If you're on the eastern edge, it won't be. It'll be um, further along than there. And if you're on the westernmost side, it'll be less than there. And the, the, the most dramatic way to describe this is it can be dark on the eastern side of central time zone, and it can still be daylight on the western side. And that's all in the same time zone. But that's one time zone in the US. Russia, for what should be five time zones, has one time zone. So even though it's the same time, the local time doesn't match what's up in the sky. It can be off by hours. So internally, you want your mount running precisely on UTC. So you can divide up what would be otherwise time zones down to fractions of a minute of degrees overhead. So th this is one that I played with a couple of years ago. Um, most mounts expect you to set them up level. Um, to get this really level, they put in a bubble level into the mount head itself. And those bubble levels are notoriously cheap, inaccurate, and not precisely installed. They just sort of have a hole, they squirt some glue in, and they press the level in, and you're done deal. Um, that's not very accurate, not very reliable, and can be off. So it's better to get yourself a little level, a little bubble, uh, either a bubble level or a um, tilt level, um, or even the level that you might have in your phone as an app. Drop that on top of your mount head when you're setting up before you put the mount head on it, on top of the tripod head, get that level and nice and sturdy, kind of like push it down if it's, if it's not on cement or asphalt, 
push it down a bit so it sinks a bit into the grass, sand, or soil um, and get it nice and level. And then you can put your mount head on there and then level it again. But nowadays they have these chips called micro mechanical, micro electromechanical systems or MIMS. And they'll do things like a three axis gyroscope, three axis accelerometer. So you can determine within a fraction of a degree, the tilt of your mount in 360 degrees, not just like two axes. So that's what you really want in future mounts is you want a MIMS chip that can determine level electronically. These chips are only about five cents a piece in your phone. They're so cheap, they're starting to build them into the, the basically the motherboard chipset of your phone. And as I was saying, if you've got a GNSS, a GNSS receiver, you can actually determine which direction your mount is pointing to a fraction of a degree by taking multiple satellite readings and knowing which satellites are going to be rising and which satellites are going to be setting. And you should not use a magnetic compass to do this because there's all kinds of metal in telescope tripods, mount heads, and even worse, there's motors that have magnets in them. So if you plop your magnetic compass or your cell phone, which has a magnetic receiver in it, on top of your mount, it's just going to skew it by anywhere from three to eight degrees. So your alignment will be off. A lot of times what people do is they'll take their mobile phone They'll hold it over the top of the mount, and then they'll walk backwards at the same tilt level and the same elevation and look and see how the compass heading changes and then realize now it's more correct or <laughs> because you're away from the magnets and the, ma and the metal. Um, but the best approach is if you integrate a GNSS receiver and you watch the satellites coming up and going down. And this is determining the azimuth from the GPS satellites in more detail. Um, it needs software to do that. Uh, the GPS, the GNNS receiver won't do that directly. Now let's talk a little bit about what's on the inside. If you have an inexpensive single axis mount, um, it'll have one motor and maybe just some analog circuitry or maybe a computer that drives the one motor. The moment you get to a dual access drive, um, you can have the two motors being run by one computer but then it's got to monitor the movement of the two motors. And you need a slightly faster computer with fancier software to do that. But the moment that you give each motor its own computer, and then you have <clears throat> the main board of the mount have its own computer, and then you have the hand controller have its own computer. It may sound like a lot of computers and a lot of software, but these things are much cheaper nowadays. So it's, it's not that expensive. So what I've seen is mounts are moving towards what is known as a uh, internally networked architecture. So the benefits of a network design is um, so long as there's sufficient source of electrical power, you can actually simultaneously drive both the motors. Now, you might have seen a mount where you say, hey, go to this. And the first thing it does is it moves one axis until it gets to the target. And the next thing it does is it moves the other axis, and now it's on the target. My mounts that are networked internally, that have both motors and the power, they can actually run both motors at the same time. So you see it moving in both axes at the same time. And since uh, in one axis it needs to move a long direction, long distance, and the other one needs to move a smaller distance, um, one motor will actually stop and do its fine adjustment while the other move, motor is still slewing at high speed. And also by having multiple subsystem computers inside your mount, you can have it touching up the GNNS receiver, date, time, location, tilt, while it's doing the other things. Uh, so it's modular. And if anything fails, there's less to repair, unless you have like a, a short circuit that destroys all the electronics in the mount. Um, and as newer things come out, instead of updating all the software for all the components, they can update just the software for just what they need, and you don't have to update everything. And as newer things come out, you can, as a modular item, swap out just the bits you've changed. So when uh, Ioptron changed from 
um, servo motors to stepper motors, there was an upgrade kit that you could buy. There were literally two circuit boards, uh, two motors, and uh, you swap out those, you load new software on the main board, and you're good to go. And now it's like you just bought a brand new uh, mount for a lot less than if you bought a brand new mount. And I like them for that. That's very customer satisfactory thinking in a, in a part of the company. Of course, I didn't take advantage of it at the time and they don't offer that anymore, but okay, I've got what I've got and it, it works. I got to fix this one problem, but it basically works. So internally, if you were to make yourself a diagram, this is what it would look like. So you have the ever popular hand paddle. It's got a display and a keypad and an LED and it plugs in the hand box jack. You've got your guiding camera on your guide scope and it plugs in the SP4 connector. You've got your laptop running your planetarium and your imaging software. Of course, there'll be another connection off the laptop going to your, your astrophotography camera, but that's not the mount. That'll connect this, the laptop will connect into the mount, the uh, RS-232, USB or Wi-Fi, goes in the main computer. Now the main computer is responsible for driving or commanding and monitoring the status of all the other computers. There's this cool interface you can get on modern microprocessors that's a hub interface or a star interface where one serial port on the main computer can selectively drive the interface to each one of the other computers. So they can all have their own computer and the, the opposite interface of this serial shared bus and you can talk to them. So you can say, hey, GPS receiver, where am I? What's my tilt? And while it's figuring that out, you can go over and say, hey, this motor moved to here, this motor moved to here. And because they've got their own microprocessors, you don't have to watch them as they move. They can start their move, complete their move, and tell you when they're done. And the next time you come by, you can go, I'm still busy. Or the next time you can come by, it can say, I'm done now. And you can run them independently. And then somewhere off of here, you have a little jack with a power on it. It will uh, be the illuminator for your polar alignment scope. And uh, most uh, modern mounts have this kind of a design. So what's the initial position of your mount? It varies based upon manufacturer and model, but all the mounts presume an initial position with perfect accuracy. So if you're reading your manual and it says your mount has to initially be level and north, great. So it's an altitude azimuth mount. You level it, eyeball it, no level, just eyeball it. And then you point it kind of north because you kind of know where north is. That's not accurate enough. Remember, the software in the computer of the mount, when it says, I presume you are level in north, it's got some zeros there. You know, it says level at damn perfect level in 360 degrees north that's precisely oh is it compass north is it magnetic north or is it true north which north are we talking about here and you know you're going to figure out that oh they meant true north not magnetic north so now you need to know what is the magnetic deviation of north at your location on the compass versus true north dealing with all that crap but it's going to make presumptions of initial position and it you know what your presumptions of initial position are is going to vary based upon the mount whether it's altitude azimuth or equatorial but modern telescope mounts can sense these things it can know what's the tilt what's the direction where you don't have to deal with this nonsense and you can just plop the mount down, get a rough approximation of level, and it can figure out the rest. Software can do this. I've seen it do it. I've just not seen it do it in the Celestron or Mead or Explore Scientific, you know, or Orion, the big names. I've seen it do it in add-ons for ioptron, certain models of ioptron mounts, but not in other mounts. So time, sight, and position. How do you get this stuff in the mount? Well, it can be manual. You can have the ever popular uh, coin cell battery backup. Um, it can be indirect 
you know, you, you get it from your phone, you enter it, or it reads it from your phone. It can be direct, you can have a, a receiver built in, or it can be dynamic, as in it's constantly updating it. Uh, one of the things that I noticed on the, um, the Meet LX200 GPS that we had at Fox Observatory was it would read date and time once it's startup. And it would actually not accurately read location. It would only read time of day to the nearest second. And that was it for GPS. After that, if anything drifts, you're on your own. So you want it to be dynamic. How fast things can move. These are called movement rates. You have slewing speeds, which can be anywhere from fractions of a degree per second all the way up to multiple degrees per second. The tracking speed, and you want different speeds based upon what your target is, uh, or even custom if you're tracking a satellite or tracking a, a comet or an asteroid. And then you have guiding speed. If you're doing astrophotography, you may want to tweak the guide speed um, to be faster or slower based upon whatever your guiding software believes it's speed of movement is. Okay, here's where the paradigm, we're getting towards the end. So for those people that are yawning, we're getting towards the end, trust me. Um, contemporary or smart telescopes, these are all the rage and they're for people with deep wallets. These are telescopes that they start out with a relatively inexpensive refractor or reflector telescope with a fairly wide, very forgiving field of view. And then they put a camera inside the telescope and it takes pictures for you. And then it may put a fake eyepiece up there with a little color display that will show you a picture of what the telescope is currently looking at. Or it may not have any eyepiece at all. It may be that you have to run an app on your computer or your mobile phone to see what the telescope is looking at. And there is no eyepiece. And you can't replace their camera with your camera. So they get to choose whether it's a good quality camera or a poor quality camera, but it's all packaged up into one price. And here's the two most popular ones. This is their latest models. On the left, we have the Unistellar EV Scope Equinox. What eyepiece? I don't see any eyepiece. And then you have the Veonis Vespera. Again, what eyepiece? No eyepiece. I think the Veonis really looks like a product Apple should build, though, because it's got that sleek design. Um, notice two things here. Uh, the, the fact that there's no hand controller on either one of them. So you are controlling this thing remotely from your computer or from your mobile phone wirelessly. But where are they getting the power from? Batteries built into the mount. Uh, let's hope they're lithium polymer batteries. Otherwise, uh, regular alkaline batteries will eventually corrode your mount. Notice that the Unistellar telescope has a somewhat real tripod on the bottom of it. The Veonis has a three-spoke tabletop tripod. How do you make sure these things are level? Now, I'm sure the Unistellar being a, a normal looking tripod has legs you can extend and retract. How do you get the Veonis to be level? What if you put it on a, an outdoor picnic table bench and it's not level? Does it figure out tilt? Does it compensate for that in the software? Inquiring minds want to know. Now, for those people that buy bigger is better telescope diameters, Take a look at these two telescopes. The one on the left is about three and a half inches in diameter. The one on the right is less than three inches in diameter. How much light are you going to be gathering through that thing? Will these work only at dark sites? How well will they do in bright urban skies like in your backyard, at your house? Inquiring minds want to know. But what if you wanted similar smartness, but you wanted to do it with your own telescope and your own camera? That's where we get the 
smart assisted telescopes. They take off the shelf single board computers, throw software on there, add some hardware interfaces, and they make it an outboard computer to your camera and your existing computer go-to mount. And here it is. This is essentially a Raspberry Pi single board computer that they put a fancy logo case on the outside of it and you, you know, probably Velcro it onto your uh, mount and you make a connection to your computer, you make a connection to your mount, you make a connection to your camera, to your guide camera, and then you talk to the software in here and say, go here, take a pretty picture, post-process it just like the smart mounts do. The difference is you get to choose the diameter of the telescope, how good it is. You could choose the camera, the guide scope. All that stuff is yours to command. And these things are much cheaper. Um, these smart telescopes are multi-thousand dollar telescopes. I think the latest one I saw from Unistellar is like $4,500. That's, that's a lot of money for the not so great of each individual piece in the telescope. You know, not a large diameter telescope, not a huge resolution camera, maybe not the fastest processor, uh, a cheesy tripod, you know, everything's smallest to make the total price lower, but still that, that's a huge margin. Okay, so um, early on things were just a motor drive, uh, you know, running one axis. You had to deal with all kinds of setup concepts and it was an equatorial mount, so you had to see Polaris. Then we got to the push two, no big motors for moving it to slew it, but it'll track once you get it there. Now we have the genuine go-to telescopes that you know will give you the ability to look up an item, I wanna to go to Jupiter. And based upon the presumptions of how you've set it up, they can go find it in the sky, go there and then track on it. But now we've got these smarter ones that have you know, built-in GNNS receivers um, and can maybe measure level and direction and setup goes a lot faster. They're a lot more accurate in their alignment, therefore a lot more accurate in their tracking. And they get rid of a lot of that first time telescope buyer frustration. But I can see the future of personal telescopes as being these smart scopes, just because they'll sell them to a much larger audience. So we're eventually gonna to get to the point where a telescope with an eyepiece might be a rare occurrence. But then professional astronomers don't look at eyepieces. They sit in their office in Chicago and sign up to get the Keck telescope in Hawaii to go take a picture for them and then email it back to them the next day. So included in the presentation are some links to uh, Ioptron, Unistellar, Veonis, and StellarMade if you want to go there and look at the details of those things. Other than that, questions. I had, them, I, had, I had everybody's microphone on that didn't want to mute themselves. So I haven't heard a lot of, a lot of uh, yawning or snoring. So something. You were saying, Helen? Uh, no, oh. it's, uh, it's Diane. Oh, okay. I was wondering if you, do you know if the smart telescopes have user serviceable batteries? Can you swap out the battery when it starts fading? They, they started that way, but I think they're built-in batteries and you'd have to send it back to the factory. Uh, to get uh. the, you know, I, if you see that they support lithium iron phosphate, LFP batteries, should actually be LIFP, um, lithium iron phosphate batteries, there's a much lower probability that they're going to do any damage to your mount. And you can use those for a much longer period of time. And so long as they have smart battery management, then you can run them up to 100% and leave them on charge all the time and run them down to 0% and charge them back up. But if it's a, uh, a lithium polymer battery that has like nickel and cadmium and things like that in it, um, those are gonna have a limited lifespan based upon how you treat them. And if you just leave them in the charger all the time, they might last three years. If you run them to zero, they might be dead the first time you do that. So a uh, battery is something to look out for. Um, let me flip back here to the batteries. I'll show you something. Come on, battery. There we go, battery. So. 
a battery like this runs maybe $30, $40. And then I made an adapter cable for it to plug directly into the mount. But they also come with these things as a cigarette lighter adapter. If your mount already has a cigarette lighter adapter, it'll be an EC5 to cigarette lighter jack, and you can plug into that. And if you ever have this battery go dead on you, the prices are getting cheaper, the battery capacitors are getting higher, so you can replace it. This guy might cost you more initially, but it's going to last a whole lot longer because it's lithium iron phosphate. And um, yeah, it should be L-I-F-E-P. Lithium iron uh, the, the lithium polymer are lighter. And for people who doesn't want to carry big bulky things. Yes, these, these are much lighter the than these. These are much lighter than these. But um, this will be heavier than this will be for the same level of power. And the reason is all the other electronics are lighter in this than they are in this. When you take this thing apart, there's a lot of high power stuff up here. This guy actually has a single circuit board with a bunch of highly integrated circuits on it to give you things like a four outlet inverter. <laughs> and, uh, you know, USB-C, high performance DC charging and all that stuff is just like a couple of chips on a big circuit board. So this is where things are going. Well, but you don't, have, you don't the... have to get big one like this. You know, you can get one that doesn't have the inverter that just has the DC. And that'll be less expensive and lighter in weight. Uh, the the comment that I have is for the electronic uh, telescopes. I think it's like for I don't know if it's now everybody has the phone and using gadget, but and I'm kind of old fart now and I don't like it because it's like you're looking pictures on Wikipedia. It's like it's it's downloading on your phone and it's not a picture. You you just push the button, you tell like I want to go there and it goes there, but you're receiving the image on your phone. So it's a crappier picture than you know you're looking at page on Wikipedia. And it's like it's so boring and useless because you know it makes no sense. For me, I, I don't like those kind of telescopes. For me, I would appreciate more an eyepiece telescope so I can look and see the stuff and get the, the challenge to find what I'm supposed to find here. Yeah. You, you sound like the people that used to uh, dis go to telescopes because you never had to learn how to run, how to operate setting circles. Yeah, I know, I know. I, I, I that that's why I mentioned that's maybe not because nope. I'm old fart and I prefer the eyepiece. No, IPs. no, no, no. It's these telescopes are intended to grow the breadth of revenue of the marketplace, and you can definitely mm -hmm. tell that when they make them look like something Apple would would build. I I, you, I prefer the Unistellar. This Vioni looks like. Uh, something on the the you know uh, the sixty very kitsch. I don't like it. <laughs> These telescopes are designed for people who want to spend money rather than understand what they're doing and how to do it. This is how do we make a telescope like an inexpensive point and shoot camera, and then we charge a lot of money for it for the margin. And we make a fortune, and then we sell off the company, and we, you know, go live in the Bahamas. And I think that's what's, what's going to happen of these is the price tags are so high, and the number of units sold is starting to grow so rapidly that the folks over in China are going to start building them, and they're going to build them cheaper and better and this will just be the paradigm shift and we'll just need to get used to it. I think it's I a guess. I think it's a unistellar, but I think Jason already bought himself a unistellar. I was gonna say that I'm one of those people that get frustrated when I'm doing the telescope thing. Yep. And I'm looking forward to getting my telescope uh, and trying not to get frustrated this time. But I can see that um, if it would be so frustrating that I can't see stuff 
mm-hmm. that I want to see, that I would go to the other, to the simpler version, even if it could cost me a little bit more to do. I would probably go that way. Well, there, there's a presumption that you get what you pay for, but that's not the case. Um, these telescopes have a laundry list of compromises based upon all the components are as cheap as they can get them to maximize the revenue for the target audience. And they're not going to fulfill your expectations. The moment you plop one of these things down and it can't do the star, uh, the uh, plate solve that it wants to do because the light pollution is too high, there's nothing you can do about it. Then you contact support and they'll say, we'll go to a darker site. Hang up. End of story. Or if you say, how come it can't stay on target because you want to track something like Mars, and that's very tiny, and you want a lot of magnification. Well, it's not going to be able to do that because the gearing in something this small is probably, you know, nylon gears, and it's not going to be that accurate, or they don't compensate for backlash, or they don't have periodic error correction to just keep things simple. So you're going to think you're paying many thousands of dollars for something that's a high accuracy and high reliability and they're not initially going to be that. that that's sad um the other thing is is it's surprising because it seems like people are really getting into when i started this and going to the fox observatory mm-hmm. there was not a whole lot of people coming out at that time and you uh, over 10 years had hundreds of people coming out afterwards so we, it seems we did, like a, we did a couple we did a couple of things. A massive amount of public outreach events throughout the county and posting them internationally and doing things like big celestial events like the partial solar eclipse. People in Florida didn't care it was partial. It was a solar eclipse. And there was thousands of people there. Um, the um, yes. Mars and closest point- approach thousands of people over several nights. You have to put in the effort to do this scale of public outreach if you expect to grow your membership. Yes, and I think even, and I think that that is definitely what happened there, but I think also discovering more things in space has brought more interest to space. I think there's some things that are being done that are are bringing more interest and my my point being is that i don't see that there is um you know like uh educational classes out there for that and i don't see places where you can go and get your telescope done by a genius bar or something like that you know type thing and i would think that that would be something that would be out there that people would want Well, um, I can tell you that Broward County adult education classes used to exist in basic astronomy, how to see things naked eye, and how to see things through binoculars. They didn't get up to telescopes. Those went away because somebody decided that's not the uh, prime focus for getting the revenue in for the adult education classes. It wasn't that there was zero interest, it just just that there wasn't enough interest to pay for the instructor and to make revenue off the classes, so they picked other things. So, yeah, um, I know that at uh, Fox Observatory, we tried for a couple of years to actually have astronomy classes, telescope classes, astrophotography classes. Uh, I can remember Jay and I actually conducting them And we'd have, you know, between five and 10 people in a class. And we didn't actually charge for the classes. And they were held at public libraries. And eventually the classes just got smaller and smaller because we educated everyone who wanted to be educated. And now we had to wait until the next generation came up and wanted to be educated. And so we stopped doing them. I think there may be a new generation out there wanting to have it done now. 
Yeah, I, I think that there is a niche market for these telescopes. I think that given the huge margin that they make off of them, that they could have 20% customer dissatisfaction and returns, and it would just be an acceptable part of the business. So, you know, look on the market, probably on Amazon, for used unistellar and used Bayonis telescopes. It won't be used because they're broken. It'll be used because they did not fulfill the expectations of the people that bought them. So I, I can see a lot of that initially, but I think they will improve over time, but they might not look like these. And for the classes, I think the new generation, we have so much access to information online, like every doctor yeah. degree who's finishing, you know, postdoc, they have a YouTube page and they're, you know, doing stuff and explaining things that the new generation will not be much interested in going to classes to learn that. Yes. They, I think the value to go to places is actually to look to the, through the telescope because images, you can have online. It's the easiest thing to do, and the pictures that you find online are amazing. I think those kind of telescopes are useless, in my opinion. How but, many people? How many people spend thousands of dollars? Oh, I just saw buy, it. No, like, to buy, no, no. How many people spend thousands of dollars not to buy these, but to buy regular telescopes and cameras, and they are so damned proud of their very first picture of the Orion Nebula. And, and you, you sort of think about it for a moment and you go, I was there at one time. I see what's wrong with that picture. I will not comment. I'll just go, good picture. Because that's, they're very proud of that. And if they talk to people, they will slowly improve over time if they're into it. But so it's, it's not that they can just go online and see a picture of the Orion Nebula. And they're great. They're like, you know, Hubble shot class. But you don't understand. I spent my hard-earned money from my wallet. I was out in the Everglades for five hours taking pictures, fighting off the mosquitoes. I came back and spent five hours post-processing it. And here's my image. Oh, this I do understand. Those yeah, are it's the pride. Totally it's the pride. But when you buy equipment like this that is super expensive, mm -hmm. it, it and you go back home with a crappy picture, I'm like, that this is useless thing. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. it's um our opinion of of Fart who you know got used. No, no, to no, no, no. I, but my my opinion is, I will have a verdict on these once the better ones come out. These are like first or second generation products, but it's also from two startup private companies. I wanna see this same telescope technology once Orion and Cinta get their hands on it, because then it will be better, cheaper, more capable, maybe even modular and expandable, upgradable, don't know. but. I can see a paradigm shift that will broaden the number of people that want to buy telescopes. But, yeah, uh, and then the other thing, you know, the flip side of, of the things that uh, when you connected your telescope with uh, uh, the Wi-Fi, for the kids to grab pictures from your telescope, mm -hmm. they love it. So that's basic the analogic of this. Yeah. Well, and I'll also, rem also so remember, it's so about I'll the, uh, you know, the generation, how they see the world through their telephones and we see with our own eyes. I also remember they were grabbing a crappy picture, but because they were, the technology, they were in the technology, they could point at their phone and go, look, I got a, I got a picture off that guy's telescope. That was all they were interested in. And it was recognizable as, well, it's grayscale, but looks like the Orion Nebula. I took a picture of the Orion Nebula, but the best one was the moon, because the moon is such a bright, high contrast target. You can get a damn good picture of the moon through that kind of rig on my phone. It's mine. Yeah. 
I didn't have and, to write, and, I didn't have to hold my phone up to his eyepiece. This is a nightmare. So uh, the the other thing is that some of them were so happy to have the image in, on their phones that they didn't even want to look through the eyepiece. I was oh, like, yeah. what? Yeah. Well, so it's once, like it's once just you go a out, change of the way they see the world. They born what? with those things in their hands. Well, once you go out to a public outreach observing event with one of these, and the only thing it can connect to is one thing that is your phone or your laptop, it's a dead end. What you need is the ability to say, I've got the computer, I can you know, make it go to, do the image, but then 50 people can all connect to that Wi-Fi signal, go to the website in the computer and drop an image you know it's not just me and my telescope showing you looky what i got on my laptop it's anybody can connect to the computer not the telescope not the camera they can connect to the computer and grab the current image on the website without even having to download an app your browser is the only app you need so yeah this is the stuff that that's the difference between these things and what I did at Parkland is what I did at Parkland. You can grow an audience with that one. This one's like one on one. Yeah, that's kind of boring. It's basic. You're showing pictures of Wikipedia is way much better. Yeah. And by the way, when we go to events, there are a lot of astronomers that, that bring their uh, pads you know, iPad or Android, they bring like the small uh, pad yep. and then uh, put our, the background to be red and they put the page or Wikipedia or some kind of encyclopedia that mm -hmm. has, uh, you know, uh, so they put the pictures they're showing on the telescope and written down in red is the material explaining what they are seeing. And then so you have the pretty picture you have the scientific explanation and you also can enjoy put your eyeballs through the telescope yep. and see something alike so this way i like to add the technology so you can see and you you can experience astronomy in three ways in one time but when it's something like that that you're gonna pay a fortune for a crappy picture uh no thank you um, remember when I would go to uh, Big Cypress on Sea Grape and I would bring my IEQ 45 mount with two telescopes side by side and I'd have a small telescope with a camera in it and then I'd have the big 180 millimeter Max Zutov Cassegrain that people could look through through a two inch eyepiece. So you could either grab the image, see the image on a small display, or you could look at the eyepiece. And I had lines of people for both of them. So yeah, if you can provide both capabilities, some people want to look at an eyepiece. I get that. Some people just want to see it on their phone. Uh, I can get that. So you need both. And the other thing is that there are a lot of participants who have some kind of uh, disabilities. And sometimes yeah. they cannot go and look at the telescope. Yep. And then having that option, it is wonderful. And, yep. you know, it's like it opens, you know, for everyone. Yeah. Um, years ago, uh, there was somebody in a wheelchair who pulled up to my telescope when I had the display on it for the camera. And he could look at the display and have no worries about having to get up to the eyepiece. Um, little kids whose parents grab them bodily and shove them up to the eyepiece when they haven't yet mastered the ability uh, to deal with parallax, it's like and that they're perception. not going to see anything in an eyepiece. But you show them a tablet display, they can get that because they're used to the tablet display at their house all the time. Yes. So, yeah, you've got it for both audiences. And that's why next week we're going to be talking about Everglades Holiday Park. Because... I want to get us a location where we can go and do dark sky stuff on a maybe not high frequency, not like every week, you know, maybe once a month or maybe quarterly or something like that. Just get the ball rolling again. And when a uh, noteworthy celestial event, let's say 
a lunar eclipse later this year. Um, go out and do something. But uh, we've got to have the right space. I think Everglades Holiday Park could be good for us. The campground is not yet fully open. The southeast corner of the campground, that would be good. Not quite as dark, but uh, I think we've got to go back out there at night and reevaluate that location because I think yeah. that could be good for us because if the campground is not fully operational and we're the only people in that quadrant of the campground, there's a much higher probability we can get them to turn off the lights in that section of the campground. I'm attempting to negotiate with them. So we'll, we'll do another nighttime visit out there. Okay. 